going to be studying radioactive, radioactive decay. So we're going to be looking at just the time behavior of radioactive decay. In class yesterday, I mentioned that there's radioactive stuff all around us. Trace is radioactive, right? It wasn't bitten by a radioactive spider, so that's why you don't see any of the cool things that come with it. So one of the first things we need to do when we're doing radioactive measurements is we need to measure how much radiation we're receiving. Different detectors have different efficiencies, so it depends on your detector and its efficiency what you're going to measure. And there's a certain amount of where you are because there's not that much radiation. So Andrew has set out radiation detectors around the classroom. Join with your lab partner at one of them. And when you're all there, I'll tell you what to do next. Uh, let's just get up and take it you like your phone? Yes, I do. You need to fire it Yeah, burn. It was burning? Given Andrew the last from last week's grade yet, so you can't blame him for them not being great. <laughs> um, if they have anything that you would ever stick in your mouth. If they don't have anything you stick in your mouth, not good. Okay, so if you look at your little detectors, let's call that a green color, like I don't know what to call it. You have the power is already on, and you have a high voltage has already been set. Well, that has been set. This one here has a faint mark. Did you not set the high voltages or it was just? I thought you should put it at zero. Okay. Yeah, that's where you want to start. Okay, so they're powered on and the high voltage is zero. So if you look at the little dial that says high voltage, there should be a pencil mark and just crank it up to that pencil mark. It should be somewhere below 600 but above 300. So I did trace it. Sorry, Trace. <laughs> it's not a big deal. So does everybody have their voltage set? This one's kind of got the grades. <laughs> you can't see. That's the right spot. Okay, so everybody have their voltage turned up to where the pencil mark is? Okay, now we're going to take our background measurement. Now our experiments are going to run for one minute. But the amount of background detection you're going to get in one minute is very small. And so we're going to run it for 15 minutes. And then we'll take our answer and divide by 15 to get the average for one minute. Now, in order to do this, you'll need to have a couple things that you understand. First, okay, so power was the leftmost of the switches. The middle one is reset. That will set the number on the display to zero. So it should already be at zero. If it's not, hit the reset button. The last one is the count. And you want to get a timer. I recommend just using your smartphone. I believe every group has at least one smartphone. Probably two per group is the middle one here. And so set a timer for 15 minutes. And then when you have that timer set simultaneously, take the right one and move it from the stop position. Now the right one is a rocker that has three positions. The bottom position is stop, 
The top position is count for approximately, but not exactly one minute. And the middle one is continuous. So you want to simultaneously start your timer and move it to the continuous setting. And then you'll just leave it there until your timer is done. When your timer beeps, make sure you instantly turn it off. So after everyone has that started, then I will move on. Yes, sir. Do it right now. Um, yeah. Scientific method for this, we don't need one. So right, don't need one for this. Does that apparatus? Oh, no, you always need apparatus. It's just the vocabulary. Well, yes, Plus, I actually heard it on my watch, too. Oh, okay. okay, is everyone started with their background? Yeah. 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 I was checking people's switches just to make sure. No. So do you have your starter now? Yeah. Yeah, 15 minutes. But I finished it over here. Whatever you think about it. I guess we are ready. Yes, yes you are. Okay, everyone has their background started. Make sure. I will set a timer for me for like, well, I don't have a timer. Forget it. Make sure that you check it periodically and run long. If you run long, it's not going to be a problem. You just divide by that time. So if it goes to like 16 minutes before you catch it, just stop at an even minute and write it down. Now, we have counting statistics here, which is a little different than anything we've done before, but we always need to have uncertainties in our measurements, right? Right. Thank you. <laughs> so... In counting statistics, your uncertainty is approximately equal to the square root of the measurement. So if you measure 100 counts, then your uncertainty is going to be 10 counts. Right? So that would be a 10% uncertainty if you only have 100 counts. With our background, you're already over a minute, and you're probably at you know, okay, let's just take DJ and Trace. How long have you been counting? Uh, uh, 12.30 and 5 seconds. <laughs> so three minutes. And there are 32 counts. So they're roughly 10 counts per minute. What would their uncertainty be? Square root of 9. Square root of 10, which is roughly 3. So they would have like 30% uncertainty. That's why we're doing 15 minutes, because in 15 minutes they would have assumedly somewhere in the ballpark of 150 counts, and then their uncertainty would be approximately square root of 150. Square root of 100, well, square root of 150 is a little bit more than 12. And so that would be a smaller percentage. That's why we're doing it. Okay. In writing your data, make sure that as you write your data, well, we haven't gotten there yet. I'll, I'll tell you when we get to that. For some background of what we're doing, radioactive decay, we've just learned about quantum mechanics, and it's probabilistic in nature, not deterministic. And radioactive decay is a classic example of that. Radioactivity is basically the nucleus is something, okay, so I, I always want something that's hard to balance, but that I can balance, and well, I'm not getting that balance, so forget it. There's my radioactive nucleus. It's kind of stable, right? It's not falling over. This is a really stable nucleus. But if something bumps it just right, it now went to a lower energy state. And when it went to a lower energy state, you all could tell. How could you tell? A big clank. That was energy coming out, right? It converted its initial potential energy into kinetic energy as it was falling. Then when it hit the table, that kinetic energy was turned into both sound energy and some thermal energy, making things a little bit warm, really small amount. So it gave off energy when it went from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. That's what radioactive, radioactivity is. 
radioactivity is in the nucleus of an atom, you have different energy states. And you can have an atom that is in an excited energy state, a higher energy state, it wants to get down lower, and there's a certain probability every second of it decaying into the lower energy state. You can't say when it's going to do it, but you can say all things being equal, after this amount of time, there's a 50% chance that it will have decayed. And so we call that time the half-life. So the half-life is the time where there's a 50% chance that it will have decayed, 50% chance that it won't have decayed. So the rate which, at which things decay is going to depend on you know, what that probability is. And so I have here my first equation, R equals lambda n. R here stands for rate. The rate at which we have decays is equal to lambda, which is a number that tells us the probability of decay per second, or per minute, or per hour, or per year, or, you know, probability of decay per unit time, multiplied by n, which is the number of radioactive nuclei. So N stands for number. Should have done it that way. <laughs> R stands for rate, N stands for number. Now the rate of decay, we actually have a name for that. It's called the activity. So the activity is how many decays per second are occurring. Standard units of Becker rail. One decay per second is a Becker rail. So the rate at which it's decaying is, purport, is equal to the probability of decay per second times the number of atoms. Does that make sense or does that sound a little odd? Um, well, the probability is exactly that, yes. A, a good example to help you understand is if you think about rolling dice. If you roll a single die, the chances of getting a one are one in six, assuming it's a fair die. And so if I roll ten dice, how many ones do I expect to get? Each die has a one in six chance. I, I, would, I would expect 10 yeah. times 1 sixth, right? Of course, 10 times 1 sixth is not an integer. I know it's going to be an integer. So it's more likely to be one than any other number. But it's all based on probabilities. If I had a billion dice and have each one has a 1 in 6 chance, then I would have a much more precise number or percentage-wise of how many I would get that come up once. It's that same way here. The statistics work with large amounts, not so well with small amounts. So we're going to be working with you know, something with a fair amount of radioactive nuclei. Now, taking this equation here, if... Oh, I... It's not what I chose, but if we take this and we use calculus, the rate is defined as minus dn dt. It's minus the change in nuclei per time. Why is it minus? Because the number of radioactive nuclei is one less every time one decays. Because it's gone on to be something else. It's no longer an undecayed nucleus. So that's why it has the minus sign there. And then we just do calculus. So doing calculus, if I take this relationship and I separate my variables, I'm going to get not separated yet. This should look familiar because even though it's different variables, it's the same thing as we did in class today, right? In a, <laughs> you weren't in class. <laughs> <laughs> If I integrate both sides, I get natural log of n is equal to minus lambda t, solve it for n, and I get n is equal to this number we start with, e to the minus lambda t. You might wonder why the exponential e 
which I think it has a name like Euler's number or something. Why that shows up so much in science is because you get it when you do an integral of dx over x. It comes up a lot, and so we have a lot in science. So that's the equation that tells us how many radioactive nuclei we're going to have at any moment in time, assuming statistics are exact. We know they're not. So when you're doing your experiment, you're not going to get numbers that exactly match this because we're dealing with statistics. Since R is just a constant times N, that same equation applies with R, the activity. R is what you're going to be measuring. So how much time do you have left in your background? Okay, about five minutes. Just want, want to make sure where we are and people don't forget. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be measuring the radioactivity starting every five minutes for a total of 90 minutes. This is 90 minutes of pure excitement. Yeah. Here's how the experiment's going to go. You are going to, after all this is done, I'm going to bring in the radioactive samples. You'll reset your stopwatch to just be a counter now, starting at zero and going up. And you will simultaneously, after resetting, start your counter, put it to continuous, because the one minutes are not reliable. They might be very in time. That's why we're doing the continuous and doing it manually. So you're going to start your counter at the same time you start your stopwatch. You do not stop your stopwatch until you're completely done. If you stop your stopwatch, you've just ended your experiment and have to start over at the beginning. Right? So don't stop your stopwatch. Even at the 90 minute mark. Even at the 90 minute mark, yes. Because you've got to get that 90 minute mark. So you start it at zero, you're going to stop it at one minute. Make sure you write your numbers down. I was telling Andrew, I once had a group that didn't write them down. They just typed them in the computer. Uh, you know, we got a computer. We just put the numbers on there. We can print it out or we can take a picture, you know, whatever. But their computer, in this case, the power cord got knocked out when they were like 85 minutes into the 90-minute experiment. And they hadn't followed the correct procedure. They hadn't written down any numbers. So they had no data. And because they did the experiment wrong, I can't just say, oh, you know, that's okay. You know, they had to spend another 90 minutes doing the experiment because they'd done it wrong. So make sure you write those numbers down each time. Right? I, I, I bring this out just so you understand the importance of actually writing your data down when you take it and not waiting to the end and saying, okay, now let's take a picture of it. Yeah. So is each that we recorded? Okay. No. You, you start at zero, stop at one. And then you write it down, and then reset it. And when you get to five, you start again. When you get to six, you stop it, write it down, reset it. When you get to ten, so you're going to start every integer multiple of five, and each one goes for one minute. So you'll stop it. You know, stop at one, stop at six, stop at eleven. We're not picking up on what you're trying to explain. Okay, so you're. Your experiment. So you record for a minute at okay. each five minutes. And each five minute okay. increment, you record for one minute. So you record okay. from zero to one, and then you record from five to six, and then from 10 to 11. Every five minutes, you do it now. And we don't do anything with it. We leave the stopwatch running. We'll right. Run. And then well, this is we have to keep resetting. Stuff. Yes, that's right. So, you so you're resetting after you write down the numbers for each one. Okay. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Yes, no, I'm not with the next So, so you'll, you'll have to write down, you'll reset, and then when you get to five, then you'll go back to the news. We're going to do a video. So, we kind of two questions. We record this number Um. Yes, that's your background. Um, also, ours was up to like 180, and it just traveled back up to 50. Is that, oh, is that supposed to happen? That is not supposed to happen. Yeah. Okay. That literally didn't touch it. So it is concerning. So write down. Right? That's, that's in your data section. You write down what happens. And so write, it went from 180 to 50, so we're going to adjust the numbers in the end. So account for that glitch. That's nice. Well, it should be right. I mean, I only have 20 seconds left.
So when we're done, we just hit stop, right? Yes. And record the number. Yes. And then that's what we said. So since people are getting to the last, I'm not going to go on the lecture until everyone has them stopped. So. We've got a minute. I guess I'm not picking up when you said like five minutes, but then you're doing it in one minute. Yes. So. so you start every five minutes. You end one minute after each time you start. So for instance, you start at zero, you end at one. You start at five, you end at six. You start at ten, you end at one. And here we go. Oh, I think I'm starting. Do we just record what the number is at the end of the minute? Yes. Okay, so. As you're, everybody should be getting their background numbers now. Yes. Yes. So with your background, you take the number of background counts you got in 15 minutes. Make sure you write that down. So you say number of counts in 15 minutes equals 216 if you're less. And then you say your background count rate is, in Wes's case, 216 counts divided by. 15 minutes is equal to whatever CPM, which stands for counts per minute. So, wait, our number that we have here, what is that again? That's the number of background counts you got. That's the number of radioactive particles you detect. Yeah. Remember, I said you're radioactive. Oh, yeah. Question. Yeah. Okay, yes, you always have to do a procedure. You don't have a scientific method. You have a procedure, you have apparatus, you have a purpose, all those things. Okay, so does everybody ever stop and record it? Yes. Okay, I have a yes in the front station. Anyone else have a recorded? Yes. Okay, that's great. I know they do. You guys have your stuff? And you got yours. Okay, so everybody has your background. Now we're ready to take data. I'm going to go get the samples in just a moment. Um, what you're going to do now is you're going to get a sample. I'm going to bring in some indium samples. Where does it say indium here? It's indium 116. What I have is indium 115, just some indium metal that I purchased that I put in our neutron howitzer. It's got plutonium and beryllium in there. And the plutonium activates the beryllium, which that's the radioactive decay of plutonium, is absorbed by the beryllium, which then emits neutrons. And so it's producing lots and lots of neutrons. That's the dangerous thing over there in the radioactive room, is the neutron howitzer. And so I have these samples in there that are being bombarded with neutrons. So if we look back at the periodic table, I'm starting with indium-115. If it absorbs a neutron in the nucleus, which there's a reasonable chance of happening, what's it going to do? Drop down to a different element? Well, if it absorbs, it won't drop down. It'll move up. It will increase, right? So instead of 115, it'll become 116, because it has still 49 protons, but it has one extra neutron. But that indium 116 is not stable. It's like my example there where it's balancing on the tip. And it's going to undergo a number of different decays. The first decay has a half-life of just over two seconds. Well, just over two seconds. By the time I get them from there to here, it's going to be, let's say, two minutes. So two seconds, you have roughly, let's say, 25 that occur in a minute because it's two minutes, or 2.18 seconds. So you have about 25 decays in a minute. If it takes me two minutes, you've gone through, or 25 decays, 25 half-lives. You've gone through 50 half-lives. In each half-life, you have 50% will have decayed. So I have 50% of the first one, another 50%, so I'm down to 25% remaining after the second one. After the third one, I have 12.5% remaining. After I go through 50 half-lives, I have one half raised to the 50th power remaining, which is essentially zero. So you're not going to measure that one. Then it has a longer one that you need to look up to find what its half-life is that will decay from indium 116 
into 10, 116. So we were talking about this before class. We are transmuting my indium and creating 10. And you're measuring the rate at which that's occurring with your spirit. Now, as you record the data, I started writing a little data table. You need to have your starting time, units of plus or minus however many minutes. So notice I didn't put a number there. You need to come up with how many minutes, you know, your uncertainty in the starting time. And then you have the activity plus or minus, and I'm not going to put the plus or minus up here. I'm just going to put CPM because how do you get the uncertainty? The square root. So you'll have a number here plus or minus the square root of that number. And then you're going to have background corrected. And you don't have to put a plus or minus here. Again, counts per minute. And that's going to be this number here minus your background for one minute. So you did the background for 15 minutes. You divided by 15 to get the background for one minute. That's what you're putting in that column. Then you're going to make a couple of graphs. And I created a spreadsheet, which I conveniently forgot to load up. Nope, not there. Darn it. My drive. Classes. I put it in the lab guy. That's why it's not there. Okay. Radioactive decay. I created a table that just has starting times and activity. And I put in synthesized data, like data that is calculated based on what is expected. So I have here a decay constant. I actually chose that decay constant based on the half-life. And so here's the number of counts per minute that I should have in each time period. And I made two graphs. This one here is a linear graph. Yeah, I'm moving it. Smart. And this one here is a semi-log graph. What's the difference in those two graphs besides the fact that I just mangled one of them? Okay, that is good, Ryan. One of them is a straight line relationship. The top one, you can see there's a little bit of curvature. You might guess it's straight, but if you put a straight edge on it, you see, no, that's not straight. It's got some curvature. The bottom one is straight. In both cases, I did a fit can't write on this. I did a fit to that exponential equation that we had. R is equal to R0 e to the minus lambda t. You need to make two graphs, one of them being a semi-log graph. And this is an example of semi-log paper, like you need to use. I want you to do it by hand to get the experience. On the vertical axis here, the vertical axis is going to be the one that's log. Notice these numbers are not the same spacings. And when you do your first trial, you'll know what your top number is. And so you can adjust your scale at that point. The horizontal is going to be time in minutes. So it's activity in counts per minute here, time in minutes here. And the time in minutes is going to go from 0 to 90. So just figure out the scale that's going to fill it all up going 0 to 90. And then if it starts, if you start like somewhere below, yeah, if you start below 3,000, you probably are going to need to get the paper that has three decades on it. So this year has three decades, that is, it goes once, ten, three times. If you start above 3,000, then you're probably good to use the one with two decades. Start those graphs when you get your first data point, plot it on here and also on the linear graph. So you plot your data on two graphs, one the linear graph 
and one an exponential graph, or a semi-log, excuse me, graph. And then you're going to find the best fit. Now, if you drew a straight line at the top one, now you can draw a best fit line. It's going to not quite fit it right. You draw a best fit on the lower one, it should fit just right. You're going to judge which one gives you the best um, fit, and then you're going to find the slope. So how you find the slope is important for the semi-log. How many people know how to find the slope of a semi-log graph? That's what I thought. So here's how you do it. Remember, slope equals rise over run. But in this case, our rise is log. So it's the log of activity 2 minus log of activity 1. And notice I'm using natural log divided by time 2 minus time 1. Now, you can do this in the calculator, and it will give you the right result. But mathematically, there is a flaw here. Natural log can only work with unitless arguments. But that's okay, because if I have natural log of A minus natural log of B, I can combine them like this. And so that's how you're going to find the slope. What are the units going to be? The top part has no units. The bottom part is minutes, so it would be inverse minutes or one per minute. When you find that slope, then you're going to find the decay constant because if I were to take this equation, take the natural log of both sides, natural log of R, equals natural log of R0 plus, well, actually minus, minus lambda T. And so what you did is you plotted natural log of R on the y-axis, and you plotted T on the x-axis. So for a straight line, Y equals MX plus B, what is multiplied by X? in my equation where I did the natural log of the activity. What is multiplied by, by x or by time in that equation? This equation here. What's multiplied by time? Well, it's slope multiplied by x. So the slope is the thing that's multiplied by time. But what is multiplied by time? Okay, it's minus lambda. And so the slope is minus lambda. That slope being what you found using this equation. And so you're going to find that decay constant. Now, the last, last step in this, and I am going to go get your samples as soon as I finish this last step, is finding the half-life. The half-life is the time where you expect half of your sample to have decayed. So if I expect half my sample to decay, that means I have n is equal to one-half n zero, right? Half is decayed. So there I just put that into this equation. Well, I can cancel out my n zeros on both sides, and I have 1 half equals e to the minus lambda time 1 half. Take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of 1 half equals minus lambda times time 1 half. So finally, to solve for time 1 half, I just have to divide both sides by minus lambda. So I have time 1 half equals minus natural log of one half over lambda. Lambda's name is the decay constant. Now, if you look at my equation in brown, that's not identical to the equation above it, is it? But it is identical in meaning because natural log of one half is equal to minus natural log of two. Didn't have space right on the other side. So they are the same thing. 
So you're going to calculate that half-life in units of minutes because the decay constant is inverse minutes. And then you're going to compare that half-life to what the literature, like the use Google, it's your friend, says the half-life for any 115 should be, or any 116, excuse me. So what's your result from today? Notice I said result. Half life. Half life. The result is the half life of India. And so you should report your half life of India and the percent error between that half life and the expected that you find online for the half life of India. That's your results. Okay, I'm going to go get your samples now. So get ready to get your time. I stop watches and whatnot because the 90 minutes starts when we start. Because we're doing it every five so minutes. Yeah. You do the math here because you show a picture of it coming every single day. Okay, if you'll pull your tray halfway out, it makes my life a little easier. There's a little tray right below the detector. Okay, here we go. Say it's a new trick. Notice I'm not touching these. Even though, like I said, they are pretty perfectly safe. It's just the procedure that you should use to okay, show your respect. Yes, yes. You start each of your time start at zero. Five minutes. Well, it should. So, so we should be reading right now. Today I can hear you for a minute. No. Hey, would you do time on your for India? Yeah. What's up? Would you do time for half for India? Did you do that at the end? Oh, no, but let's go. And then, so what was that? What was that? I got zero. Three to four minutes. Yeah. Fifteen to four. And at one minute? So why did that? Wait, there's not much. I just got it out. How fast is it? Hey. It's gone really fast. At zero. What was it? It was zero, so you didn't write that down. I don't know. 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 I thought you said oh, yeah. 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 okay. yeah. okay. yeah. yeah. okay. yeah. and then the first thing that one minute yeah. 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 No, we uh, reset. Uh, yeah. Wait, when it hits no, four, it's like five. Or, yeah, when it hits five. Stop, should I reset right now? Yeah, the uh, sure it's it's time time at the five minute. It's like we need to I don't think so. I think it's a few minutes. Oh, okay. So we stop it at one minute. Yeah. And then you wait till five, and you do that. That's taking our average. Okay. You, you need to put your, your activity and then your background correct. You always do it. That's why you use it. That's a 426. 
so many yeah, other questions. Yeah, we're estimating. Background correct. Okay. Is that you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Make sure you write that down to explain. Okay. I got a question about the right there. He's the TA. Yeah, just to clarify, yeah. Yeah. you started yeah. in the yeah. yeah. No, we So we like you stop it until five minutes. The five minutes start. I just got it. No, that was me. I did it. So, so we start and then we reset the screen. Can I see the screen? 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 So what do we do after me? Yeah. Okay. So then we subtract the what? Or minus the usual. You did that since minus the usual. Okay. Yeah, really good. Of the space of the experiment. We have five minutes to yeah. And like I said, get your graph paper and start your graphs and have your graphs all done. So when it's in Actually, you don't. There's no point to sit around and your graphs. I think we're going to have to do it. Wait, where is the teacher? Is this it? Um, yeah, this one's either here. Well, I have a bunch of them. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that would, and, and actually, after the first one, the over which one is Oh, wait, we're Yeah. Okay. This one's over 3,000, you say? Right here. Oh, no, Thirteen point seven. So four zero six three. This is put it in my mouth. All right. Four. Yeah, you got three. Two. Oh, that yeah. four. Yeah. It was my check. Oh, Okay, so remember, if your first measurement is over 3,000, then I'll use this paper that has two decades. If it's under, then use this paper that has three decades. Yeah, I have no idea. I would just make sure. Stop recording. This is that if it's over 3,000. 
Yeah. Uh, the original grass.